So I'm going to start today with a deeply personal story. Uh, this is a story about how our family got a bonus three years with my dad. And it is also the most amazing example uh, that I have of the creative application of data and technology. And it all started with this. Uh, my father was diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer in December of 2008. Uh, the prognosis was grim, and as everybody in this room probably knows, uh, the options were very limited. And it didn't matter where we went, whether we went to Presbyterian or Mayo or MD Anderson or anywhere else, uh, all the leading experts in all the leading institutions told us the same thing. They told us that there was really nothing we could do. Uh, and this didn't really reconcile for us, despite the fact that all the expert opinion was corroborated, because we were checking these vibrant online communities where we were seeing people that had self-identified as patients, and they seemed to have been posting for a long time. So being data geeks, we pulled out Excel, and we wrote down the first post date of every single individual. And when we were done, a very morbid realization came upon us. Only 11 people had been posting for over a year. So we made a personal appeal to all 11, asking, what are you doing? Tell us a little bit more. Uh, nine of them responded, and seven were on the same clinical trial. Uh, GTX was the ultimate gift to our family, because almost immediately, my dad's energy levels went up, his CA99 markers went down. Uh, we were able to travel as a family. We had dinner almost every night as a family. And that is the gift of almost 1,000 dinners, because we refused to follow the, blindly follow the expert advice. Uh, and so the reason that I share this story is just to set up uh, the premise of this presentation, which is that the data you have really shapes how you see the world and therefore the possibilities that are available to you. And sometimes it requires pushing on the data, taking a different lens to the da data, and challenging uh, some of the expectations. The second thing is, uh, if we had this incident happen just a decade earlier, none of those data sources would have existed. Uh, and it really brings about a natural follow-on questions, which is what data is hiding within our org organizations? What data is hiding out there in the world that maybe you haven't analyzed yet that can help inform better decisions? Now, to really push on this, bear with me, and I want to take a quick little trip down memory lane, rewind the clock all the way back to the 1960s, where this was a real ad. Now, these physicians, they weren't trying to kill America. Uh, they, we didn't have the, data, the longitudinal data to know just what a bad idea this was. And this wasn't the first time or the last time that this happened. If we rewind the clock another 30 years, radium, it made your skin glow, literally. And 20 years before that, heroin, to treat your kid's cough. Now, these are ridiculous. Why would I start a presentation with these examples? Nobody in this room would accept the medical care of 50 years ago, let alone 100 years ago, certainly not for anybody that you love. But I would submit to you that most of us walk into work and we practice management rituals that are a lot older than any of these ads. Now, this is an our idea. Gary Hamill, widely respected as one of the leading thinkers on management, points to the fact that management is a technology and that it was largely invented at a time when we were changing from an agrarian society to an industrial society. Now, around that same time, Henry Ford said something that I think is equally relevant today. What he said was that if he asked people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. So I want to push on that for a little bit and submit to you that Email is the ultimate faster horse. Email is simply a digitized memo. It borrows its language from the days of the carbon copy. But email is actually a little bit worse because it gives people the illusion that we're moving faster, while in fact, it, it becomes a great way to let other people reprioritize your day for you, or at the very least, interrupt your flow on a pretty regular basis. Email's not alone. Data's been around for a long time, too. Every one of the companies on the screen, they use data. They use data to optimize supply chains, to maximize margins, to market it to us on their terms in increasingly more precise ways, but not ours. And then we saw the rise of these web titans. And one of the insights that they had that is so obvious in hindsight is that one of the deepest rooted human emotions is the feeling of being understood. And they've actually used that to shift the data lens to be in the service of their customers, to better empower, to better enable their customers. Uh, and so this sets up the deceptively simple question that I'd like everybody to ask themselves, and that is, what would happen if in your organizations, your people were as obsessed with understanding understanding your own people as they are understanding your customers? And the answer is, is obvious and intuitive. It's why Amazon does such a good job of showing us what we're interested in, why Facebook curates a news feed just for you, and why applications like Spotify and Netflix are actually differentiated in algorithms that learn our preferences and then in turn customize our experiences. And I would propose to you that the reason is that in our personal lives, we have choice. 
And so we choose to do business with companies that take the time to understand us and personalize our news, shopping, travel, entertainment, and other needs. But then most of us walk into work and we're suddenly beholden to these one-size-fits-all policies, processes, and tools. And the result is the largest epidemic that isn't getting nearly enough attention, and that is that 70% of workers today are disengaged at work. Now, that Gallup st study it also showed that 24% of those people are actively disengaged, which means they wake up in the morning, they shower, they change, they get dressed, they drive into work, and then they spend their entire days deliberately working to undermine the missions of the organizations that employ them. And it's not funny because all of humanity's greatest challenge will require people at work to solve them. Those people will be parts of organizations, and hopefully those organizations can stop this trend line. Uh, not the headlines, but that trend line is pointing towards S&P 500 companies lasting only 12 years. Uh, the rate of progress when we think about technology more broadly, think about the state of healthcare 100 years ago, think about automotive, aerospace, high tech. Now contrast that with what work looked that, like then, and now. <laughs> Again, not really that funny because this is, where, this is where we haven't made a tremendous amount of progress. And what is really happening is technology is radically transforming industries, evolving businesses, but the technology of management itself isn't keeping pace with all of these developments. So a few opportunities uh, we're going to dive into, but I just want to really hammer this point home. Who in this room does an annual performance review? Just show of hands. All right, so this is a more progressive room. If I were to ask you what's wrong with them, you might point to recency bias or a million other things. You'd all be right. 97.2% of us do them. 98% of us think that they suck. Now, shockingly, 58% of the people that design them agree that they suck. We still do them. This is what training looked like 50 years ago. This is what it looks like today, although I'm being a little bit unfair because we have digitized it. But it's still one size fits all, role-based, point in time. It's not delivered precisely at a teachable moment, at a time when you're going to get the practice and feedback you need. And where we see the biggest opportunity is really process. Organizations today, we're drowning in process. We have process for planning and process for budgeting and process for approvals. We have process to change process and process to communicate and train and then now change process. It's like this plaque that's clogging organizational arteries, and it's because we're using process as the primary risk mitigation strategy as organizations get bigger and bigger. So I would propose to you that in a day and age where it's so cheap to store and process information, that there's no reason that the first time and the hundredth time that anybody does anything, that the process should be the same. The first time is truly a teachable moment. It is a great opportunity to pair somebody with an expert, deliver a training intervention, do whatever you need to do from a compliance point of view. But from a bureaucracy point of view, we should be able to lean processes out as people demonstrate more competence. Now, the frustrating thing, we solve this problem in our personal lives. Most of the people in this room probably don't write down step-by-step -step directions on how to get to a restaurant anymore. Behind the scenes, these things are doing amazing things. They know your location, they're hitting mapping applications, they're layering on ambient data, but the reality is to use a consumer, it's turn left. Uh, and this is technology acting as a coach. It's helping us to perform better. And in a high-performance world of Formula One racing, or really any high-performance world, some of this is already happening. Ferrari was the first to build one of these. What you're looking at on the screen, if you haven't seen one before, is a sensing and actuating center. And what this does is it collects billions of data points in real time during a race because every team thinks they're coming in with the winning strategy. And the reality is the, cars, the technology is so regulated, the pit crews are almost all the same speed. But what's happening is, an oil spill, it's too cold or it's too hot or an accident happens and they need to adjust race strategy in real time. And this was the difference that made the difference for Ferrari for a really long time. Today it's table stakes. Now the really good news is most of our businesses don't require this amount of data in real time in order to optimize decisions. So if we were to sort of summarize how you can think about the role that technology should be playing in the workplace, I'll reduce it down to three principles to help us execute faster. The first one is that technology should be acting as a coach. In most businesses, technology acts like an angry referee. It yells offside after something has happened, and it's because it's very much business rules driven. Whereas in our personal lives, most of the tools we choose to have on our phone and most of the apps that we love on our phones are actually predictive. So they're trying to understand us and they're trying to coach us. Uh, so that is the first distinction. The second is really the role that data can play in acting as a sixth sense. And what we mean by that is that if you instrument the organization in the right way and 
uh, you actually use lead indicators instead of lag indicators, you can inform people's intuition at the time of decision and make more evidence-based decisions easier for people to do. And the last one is the least popular in large organizations, but we believe that over time, we're going to be seeing hierarchies displaced with ecosystems. And what we mean by ecosystems will prevail over hierarchies is that much like in the web, influence is, is more merit-based, we believe that organizations, in order to move really, really fast, need to prioritize influence over authority. The goal with all of that is not to get you to think about your tools so much as thinking about our thinking. And if we use the example of a biopharmaceutical company and think about what's at stake in executing faster, the average, the average product today will do $1.2 billion in, in, in peak sales. And ignoring all the other issues, if we just focused on time, that means that we can quantify the economic impact of a single day of delay to about $3 million. But we don't think like that, and we typically don't have one-day delays. Of course, that is the economic impact, and that is the value of time. But time is more than just patent life. It is also patient life, and I think that's what energizes everybody in this room. So I'm going to shift gears now to talk a little bit about what we can do in larger organizations today to actually adapt and lean into some of these opportunities. But I want to start by framing something that I know is not popular, but the word transformation or treating transformation as a discrete project, really. I would submit to you that transformation is actually a fail state. It is what you do when you've gotten a whole bunch of things wrong upstream. And that what we should be aspiring to is an evolution. Uh, and an evolution that gives us a lot of variation and allows us to properly select the best, uh, uh, the best variations. Now, structurally, there's a lot of things that organizations can do uh, to try to drive innovation. Uh, but what we've seen work, and it doesn't matter whether you're talking about a center of excellence, an innovation center, or, or a company that you funded on the edges, in the best of all of these uh, structures, what you have is an obsession with actually building that competency and confidence within the larger organization so, so that you're trying to get to the largest mass of people. And I'll give you a very simple framework uh, that we got from, uh, from ATK, actually, in terms of how to think about that. The opportunities that digitization creates immediately drive opportunities for acceleration, and that can happen within your silos. Over time, when you're building a culture of experimentation, the really hard thing to do is build the confidence and capability of a team. And I would submit to you that one of the things that we tend to do is, in, and it's this quintessential pilgrimage of executives to go to Silicon Valley and see what the cool kids are doing these days to execute so much faster. And that can scare people, uh, but it doesn't actually create the competencies that you need within your organization. So instead, we propose that organizations need to become way more obsessed with actually educating people on how to embrace agile practices thinking about the metrics that you need uh, in order to accept failure, run boot camps, run what if scenarios, what, what if uh, 3D printing is a reality tomorrow and everybody has one at home? What if we get to you know, $10 sequencing of a genome? What, what if we could actually move beyond the pill and, and provide services and subscriptions to manage specific conditions and design thinking and hackathons and crowded, a lot of the things that we've heard here today. And ultimately, I would propose to you that if we get all of that right, we won't need to transform because we'll identify identify those uh, disruptive opportunities and lean into them. Uh, Uber did that really, really well. Uh, they timed the market w well. There was a lot of convenience. You had mass penetration of phones and all of these things. But I think the question that people should ask themselves is, why did they win when Lyft and Halo were also in market and did all those things too? And I would submit to you that, again, it's their culture. Uh, they galvanized the organization around a lot of experiments. They localized the experiments to every single city. And so through that, they were able to identify things like elastic pricing, uh, which you know is surge pricing, which was really a way to meet supply and demand during during rush hour because dispatchers were keeping the drivers busy otherwise. UberX, Uber Eats were also selected out of hundreds of experiments that you didn't hear about. And ultimately, they found some really disruptive things with how they get packages from point A to point B or, or, or how they scale up uh, with self-driving cars. So we've heard a lot about all of these technologies, and we've talked a lot about how all of these technologies are exponential. The thing I love about exponential medicine is that in addition to all the familiar faces that we see against all of these exponential technologies, what we get to do is we get to change the aperture and actually look at a much wider ecosystem of organizations. Uh, and within healthcare, these are just the AI vendors that are playing, and this is not meant to be an exhaustive list. It's just meant to, to get you to question whether you have the sensory acuity to know 
know everything that's happening in the marketplace. Uh, the same thing is true if we look at uh, uh, something like security. We've heard a lot about blockchain. There's a lot of companies that have really leaned into that opportunity. There's a lot of modern companies in the security space that are now leaning into healthcare as a result of what we're seeing. Uh, but we've also heard that the biggest opportunities will come from the convergence of all of these things. So I want to just look very quickly at a very crude model of what our, our industry really looks like. And if you sort of look at the commanding heights of any one of these areas, whether you're a medical device, and you're probably looking at all those companies that are nibbling at the edges. Uh, you're probably thinking about all of this unbundling. You probably have a corporate development arm that's investing in a lot of these things. But if all of it is happening on the outside, how much are, is your current core team doing to actually learn and grow and adapt uh, into some of these opportunities? Uh, the same thing is true if, we, if you're you know, a pharmacy. And it's not just the pill packs. It's it's, it's telemedicine, it's all these other things that are going to be disruptive to our business models. And I'm going to close by just zooming into a deconstructed model of a pharma company and excuse the crudeness of it. I just want to show how much is happening at every phase uh, and every function within the organizations. If you look at phase three of the drug discovery process, you've got organizations like Circulation uh, partnering with Uber to deliver non-emergency transport. Uh, that could apply for clinical trials, uh, whether it's for diagnostics, whether it's for getting people to infusions. You've got groups like Acurian uh, providing an intelligence advantage to site selection. You've got groups like Science37 uh, that are trying to move some of these uh, trials onto mobile devices. The FDA itself is becoming more open and transparent. They're putting the recipes online. And we've approved 3D printing pills. So as an industry, when these become much cheaper, are we going to have a Napster moment where we try to fight the regulations? Because Napster doesn't exist, but we've changed how we consume media. Uh, are we actually thinking about each one of these things? We heard a lot about the Kodak uh, thinking of themselves as being in the film development business as opposed to uh, being in the capturing magical moments business. 23andMe is now moving from democratizing genomics to actually using that data set to run clinical programs. Uh, Verily, uh, previously Google Life Sciences, doing some great things uh, with uh, the serialized uh, glucose monitoring through the contact lens and, uh, and, uh, and the band. Managed markets, same thing. We're seeing groups like Explorasys aggregating data uh, in an unprecedented way, uh, actually uh, now acquired by IBM. Clover and Oscar and other progressive payers that understand how to speak to digital natives and are also just rethinking the model. Groups like Omada uh, that are providing uh, disease-specific uh, 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 programs. Groups like Merge that are really trying to disrupt how uh, the clinical workflows happen. Sensatia promising to automate all the admin functions within a hospital. Uh, so th this was not at all meant to be an exhaustive list. But what I did want to do is make the point that Uber, as an organization, they didn't need to build all these foundational technologies. In fact, it was the unbundling that happened before that created the opportunity for their business model. You had the phone penetration. You had the mapping applications. You had payment processing. Even the telephony and the expense management and, and things like Spotify, each one of those things existed. What they did is they packaged them in a new way. And these are some of the opportunities that exist today. And so I'm going to close with one organization that I think has really done that uh, from, uh, uh, from the beginning of their journey. 1997, Jeff Bezos writes a beautiful letter to shareholders, in my opinion, the best letter to shareholders, where he says, do not think of us as a, as a book distributor. Do not think of us as just an e-commerce company. Uh, we're going to be very disruptive. We're going to innovate. We're going to differentiate on price and cost. We're going to take swing and a miss. You'll see us innovating across a whole bunch of industries uh, and get ready to lean in if you're going to invest in us for the long term. And if we measure them by that, did they do that? Yes. I mean, reputation management and ranking, they patented one click. They did a lot of innovation in warehousing and distribution. They didn't just disrupt how books are distributed to us. They disrupted the book publishing business and how we consume those books with Kindle. And they had swing and a misses like Fire, and they had huge successes like Prime, and now they're in original content programming. And the reason I'm sharing all of those experiments, uh, that they ran well and that they executed well, is that when you combine all of those things together, what you have is a small fraction of their profits today. And their economic engine is actually Amazon Web Services, which means that as an organization, at some point they realized that despite the fact that they're executing so much better and despite the fact that what they're doing was very good, what they're doing was less valuable than how they did it. 
And that is uh, an organization that had the confidence to lean into some of these opportunities. Uh, so I hope we've uh, piqued your imagination to really explore how all of these exponential technologies will be converging and the opportunities that exist for us as an industry uh, to shift from Irun's law to Moore's law by actually leaning into all these opportunities and exposing the maximum amount of people to them. And I'll leave you with an Einstein quote who said, you can't solve today's problems with the same thinking that created them. Thank you all so much.